it's a magical day here at HGC North America where several teams, they're starting to rise and other teams are looking to clinch their spot towards BlizzCon. It's an action-packed Saturday we have here. My name is Jay Howe. Joining me is Dreadnought. And Dreadnought, you and I have dissected this a hundred different ways. There's so much up in the air for these teams. There is a lot on the line for about every team, except for maybe debatably middle of the pack here in North America with Heroes Hearth Esports and their opportunity to secure their chance at BlizzCon this weekend. And then, as we said, between Simplicity, LFM, and No Tomorrow, it is a doozy as we round the end of the year here to figure out who, in fact, will be trying to climb their way Way out of the crucible. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the standings so we can see how things are shaping up. For Heroes Hearth, if you are a Heroes Hearth fan, and I know there's a lot of you out there, they need to win one game, not a series dreadnought, one game, and they have clenched their way in what will be a monumental case for coming from the open division. Tempo Storm and Team Freedom still hanging out. We will be looking at teams like Octalysis and LFM today as well. And the middle, the movers and shakers, and most notably about these standings, Dreadnought, is the change. LFM has climbed out of the Crucible spot for now by way of a plus minus on their game score, have moved into that sixth place, and are in the playoff hunt. And that is what we've been highlighting here, though, that is it is very tense, though, Yes, LFM is technically out of it at this point in time. One, One game. game is all <laughs> it takes to be able to separate that back into a tied position out for Simplicity. And those three teams at the bottom of North American standings all have two opponents remain. And every one of them have at least one that remain in the top four of the North American standings. So it is a difficult kind of landscape laid out here for NA. It's going to be an exciting finish to HGC Phase 2 here in North America. As we see earlier, Granite Gaming Method continuing just mega struggles in Europe, but Fnatic increasing their climb and their race to try to get to BlizzCon by taking down Liquid 3-0. We'll have Team Freedom and Heroes Hearth for the later part of the day, but to open up our day, we have LFM versus Octalis. You've seen the rise of Octalis. It's been meteoric since we've come back from the Western Clash. LFM, though, Statistically, they're on the rise. They're starting to pick up wins. They've moved out of that crucible range. They have a tough opponent today in Octalysis. Next week, they'll play No Tomorrow, potentially playing for the playoffs. No Tomorrow has a chance to make it in as well. Simplicity, there's so much that can happen all around North America. It's exciting to watch. Octalysis, they win now. They hope that Heroes Hearth wins later because then that final matchup in Week 10 features Octalysis versus Team Freedom, which could be for the number three maybe the number two spot, depending on how things go. It's just wild. It's way too much to get into. There's a whole lot we want to cover, but Dreadnought, it's exciting nonetheless. I think the biggest TLDR for me, I think from home, you know, if I was to be, what are the ones I'm looking out for? It is Simplicity and LFM. Every game that these guys play for the rest of the season matter. It doesn't matter if it is, you know, the opponent on the other side, it doesn't matter the match score. If they end up getting themselves just a game off of any opponent, it suddenly could be the difference between you're in the playoffs or you don't even know if you're going to be returning in 2019. Yeah, well, we heard from our players about this matchup because every map is crucial from here on out. But we heard from our players. We're going to check that out right now. Going into this weekend, it's a very important matchup for us because we need to get as many match wins or series wins as possible to avoid the Crucible and make it to playoffs. Going into Octalysis, for me, they're the scariest team just because you can lose the game before you play it. You can just lose the game and draft a lot against them. We're going to make sure we examine all their drafts, look at their priorities, and see what kind of cheese they pull out on us so we're not caught unprepared. Uh, what stands out with LFM is I actually think their team fighting's pretty good. Even though the record shows them being, I guess, in Crucible, but I think they're actually a lot better than what the record shows. We're gonna have, definitely have to watch out for swabs, especially Goku, because I'd say he's like top three in the role in North America right now, and he's improved a lot over the last year. So definitely gonna have to watch out for him making plays. The match against LFM should be a 3-0, but it could also just be a 3-1. So it should be fairly easy, but can't, can't let her guard down against him.
Swamp said, well, we, it's possible you can lose the game before you even play it against Noctalus. This, the drafting has been the name of the game. We There was a lot of respect towards Swabs from Bud's side. We know Goku to be one of the best, if not the best, we have here in North America in the off lane. So there is some contention in that department. But overall, a lot of it does come down to the drafts. And Dren, I know you have a lot of thoughts on the draft because we've seen the Wild, and then we start to see it come back more and more to normal. And I know you've got some thoughts on that. Yeah, the biggest thing for me is that depending on the opponent that we see for Octalysis and the kind of weight that exists, not only in that game specifically, but the series that it might have itself, when their backs are against the wall, things become closer to standardized than it has been. Yes, there are always that deviation of maybe a one-off pick that is a tier three that is going to fit within their composition and be that, you know, catching my opponent off guard. But we came into this going, this is new meta breaking the meta. And it has been very much the, as we move against Heroes Hearth Esports, becoming more and more to the norm. So I have a lot of questions going against LFM. Do we get that major deviation based on the confidence levels that they have? And even if we do, is that necessarily the best thing for Octalis is moving forward in North America? I think that's a to each their own type circumstance. But I will say that for me, I look at that as quite a concern for them, that adjustment through the draft, depending on who they're playing. They've got two more matches, and it starts now with this one versus LFM. Let's take a look at the battlegrounds to see where, we're, where we will start things off. And it will be Volskaya picked up by Octalysis by far. Their most prioritized battleground, Dreadnought, they have picked this map nine times more than any other map that they have. They love this map. They love to play around it. We see the bands on Braxis and Sky Temple, Octalysis, Rids of Sky Temple every chance that they get, and taking away any of those crazy picks with Braxis. But with Volskaya, this has been a map where things have been more standardized somewhat, but there's always a few tricks up their sleeve. They love to play the Mayab. They love to play the Sergeant Hammer. I'm just curious how much of that will be let through in these drafts. Yeah, it is going to be interesting. And it's also one of those battlegrounds that we could expect to possibly even get Justin over onto that D.Va around the control point. It is very, very easy to gain value out of that and even maybe further the advantages gained when you pick up the very first protector itself. For LFM, the one thing I'm looking for in this game is not only, I mean, the draft. You heard Swaps talking about it. Every team going against Octalis is a concerned about the draft and drafting. But for me, it is their macro sense. How good are they going to be not only drafting towards macro, but executing in the game? Because I think that if LFM has a shot against Octalysis, that is the area they need to step up in. We're going to see what they can muster up. LFM, we heard Swab say they're going to study their drafts, figure out the prioritization. You and I touched on it at the end of yesterday. The big talking point for this weekend is the Toronto rework. Yeah. Buds, prior to the rework, was one of the few people that would occasionally dabble in that Toronto role. So that is a hero that will always be a point of contention when we look at sustain, which is something that happens around this point. And that is something I actually completely forgot to bring up when talking about this series itself as well, is this is a huge advantage for LFM purely on the lack of stability that exists within this patch itself, being the not only underdog team, but expecting that Octalus is going to get wild. You are on a new patch. You didn't know what Octalysis would necessarily value within this patch itself in the first place. So you didn't get that major setback like maybe other teams did against Octalysis with that well-rounded time to be able to build up their strategy going into it. But it is kind of a double-sided coin. You could also argue that means Octalysis is going to get that much more wild and your ability to understand how to react be that much more difficult, right? But I would say I don't think that patch was big enough and affected enough heroes for it to get that drastic, but we'll see as it unfolds. When we've seen Octalysis stray away from the norm, I saw a draft, I'm like, hey, this is one of the more normal drafts I've seen yet. And then they come in with what we would presume would be something like a melee, like a Zeratul that we've seen on this map, and they just pick a last pick, Valera, without an Abathur, and they made it work in the previous part of part two. The Maev is gonna be banned out, which means Genji has been let through. So there's some counterplay towards a lot of this. The Genji pick has been somewhat contested lately and let through the majority of these drafts. Deckard is strong, Taronda is strong, Urella is strong, but does Genji take priority over those? Yeah, and that's the hero. The Taronda value on Volskaya for North America is the one I'm looking for. Where, what do we see these teams dis uh, decide on and want to select towards? But we're going to get ourselves the first pick there for Dark Chimera into that Deckard Kane. Been a huge playmaker on the Deckard Kane here. And it does seem like for, I don't want to say most because we haven't gotten a large enough sample size, but for a lot of teams, Deckard still holding his own in that first pick first band slot. The area control that he provides on the control point seems so incredibly strong. We saw the pickup yesterday attempted by Endemic, the Zul Taranda. Zul, the last time we saw him was by Octalysis. I don't know if this would be the battleground to really test that limits, but we do get the Taranda paired with the Yurel, so Goku on that very strong solo laner. 
Anytime you see a Toronto picked up on the other side, we talked about it yesterday, but the blinds and hard crowd control, individual threat towards her are going to be a very valuable thing. Another thing is you've got to consider how much spell damage you're going to have onto your team because the 30 spell armor, she has the ability to stack it. If she gets auto attacks to reset, spread it onto so many targets, it's very difficult to deal with. Well, Rainer going to handle his own on that. You mentioned the blinds. The the, the One of the weirdest things to me is the complete lack of Johanna that generally comes from Fury. He loves aggressive yes. warriors. He loves to play around that. And they're willing to say, it's OK. Maybe they go Johanna themselves. Falling Sword, we know that exists. But they take away the garage. They could go Muradin on the side of Octalysis. But there's been very little priority on that Johanna role. That's a really good point that you bring up. And it is going to be interesting now, especially as the meta, meta adjustments have come in. Fury's a player that I don't mind when he does go with those less offensive ones. For me, it views like I can't help but feel like since he's moved over to LFM, part of the learning a standard and developing as a team has been I'm going to be that proactive warrior up on the front yes. lines. And so I agree with you. It's not so much an individual player as much as the synergy with that for the rest of the team here. But Jay Hao, it is getting wild here. We got ourselves double support with the white man and a Zul pickup. I'm assuming that is justing on the Zul. So that is our warrior, if we will. So they do get the easy setup, and they like the white main in the double support role. We saw that with the Uther before. If I'm LFM, Biggie loves himself some Li Ming. And this is an opportunity that I think if you give that, Prismat might pick up that role. There's the Johanna. So they do go Johanna with the Phoenix. You're looking to kill somebody when you get them locked down in that, and you need a lot of damage from this last pick. Yeah, they do need that absolute single target, just one shot, one kill capability. Phoenix pretty vulnerable. Rainer and Deckard all very vulnerable to that. I agree with you on the fact that I thought it was going to be the Li Ming, but the fact that Octalis has taken a little bit of time here, don't think it's going to be the Chromie. Who else has a ranged single target burst that we're looking at here? Cassia, interesting choice, but I can't help but feel like pretty good in the fact that we got the double auto attack response on the other side. This is a First time we've seen it, but something moving forward that is always going to be an option within drafts and theory crafting wise that I hadn't considered. If you pick Toronto, you enforce auto attackers being selected, which is only going to promote having Cassio True picked shot. later on. We haven't seen True Shot Aura picked yet. Yeah. It's been Lunar Flare, the safety range, the extra 50% range, you're landing skill shots that don't normally exist. But with double support, maybe that's forgiven a little, and we see the true shot. The true shot, you get the bonus auto attack damage, but you also reset your hunter's mark. So if you want to dot somebody up and light them up, I mean, on that front line, it's like, here, enjoy taking all of these shots. Charge Strikes does really well. Thunderstroke does come out in the single target damage area. Charge Strikes works well against Deckard. He's, his potions can only heal one at a time unless you go Ruby at four. So there is some consideration, but the most important thing that you brought up was the blind. Yeah. And blinding that double auto attacker, there's a lot of, of counterplay on both sides here. It's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, I just really love that play uh, to go with the Toronto and the late Cassie. I don't think there's always going to be an option within the draft, but you, again, remove the incentive of a mage, then you pick up the counter of uh, the Cassie itself. Toronto and Cassie don't have enough synergies for me to be like, this is going to stick around like in the future as a drafting strategy. Uh, but I think it's a clever adjustment here from Octal. You also get extra attack damage for Toronto when you go that talent. So maybe that acts as the second auto attack assassin as well. It's time to go into game number one here. Octalysis taking on LFM. And here we go in the blue. It is Octalysis where Justing is the front line Zul here. We're gonna have Goku in the off lane, this time on the URL. Drated, in fact, is the Tyrande. Prismaticism on that Cassie and last up Buds playing the White Man. On the other side, trying to hold on to their playoff spot. We'll need every win they can get. Series victories even better. It will be Fury on the front line. He'll be on the Johanna. Swamps will be on Blaze. Droplets on Phoenix. Figgy on the Rainer. Even Dark Chimera on the Deckard. Interesting to see the continued Laws of Hope selection, even within the Toronto meta here for Johanna's. It's, it's probably the most surprising thing you and I are like, Okay, I can see that, but if I have four seconds left on, or four seconds less on a self cleanse, that seems pretty strong. Yeah, the forgiveness of that shield in the unstoppable versus that kill potential seems like more often than not it would trade out beneficial. But we'll see if that comes to be a problem here. I can't help but feel like another part of the thought process in this game specifically, double support. You're going to have to sustain. Is that Toronto really going to have enough damage capabilities there? 
I want to see if the Taronda build does divert from the norm now that it's in this double support role. Since Draded is the second normally assassin, he's the flex player for this team. Could rotate over into more damage, the true shot I mentioned at level four. But there's also a Loon's Chosen at level seven that if you need to prioritize healing onto that front line, you can dot them up mark your own ally, attack, and then dish out some additional healing that would be needed. So we'll see if that does change up here, given the draft. But, you know, I've been talking about the, you know, kind of direct counter that it feels like Johanna provides to Toronto. If you go that play style, it only gets more exaggerated there, Jay. How and the fact that your damage output being so dependent onto those auto attacks and resets as well, just feel like that might be too big of a concern due to that. But if that blind is on cooldown and suddenly we see that much auto attack focus coming out from Octalysis, may be problematic here. Octalis is, though, starting up this support camp here. It's a four versus four. Yorel is making her way up faster than Blaze. See if they're going to get the initiation falling down to 15%. Goku shows in with the first leap. Do we get an initiation? Nope. LFM, LFM here willing to give it up. It was all about Goku and his positioning. He leapt into position, wound up the hammer, and said, walk forward. I dare you. That This thing is glowing. You know what that means. When it's glowing, you know what's up. And forced to walk away there. My goodness, Zul, I've never heard that sound before. Yeah, that was terrifying. That's creepy. Yeah, I'm ready to never hear that again. <laughs> Shout out to uh, whoever worked on that skin for creeping us all out here. Yeah, that was <laughs> ridiculous. We here. just missed Friday the 13th by one day. It was Friday the 14th yesterday. Would have been, you know, fitting had we got that. One thing to keep in mind here, though, before we get ourselves the 20 seconds out from control point A, is a pretty big adjustment when looking towards white main build, but the biggest thing is still a standard so far when looking at Draded on that Tyrande. Still going with the Lunar Flare damage and increased range. Be interesting, because this is the first iteration of double support Tyrande we've gotten in North America. Prismat will hold point, but that's only as a Cassia. Figgy trying to trade out with Buds there. It's Justin making his way down. Nice hammer. Lockdown's going to be there with that bone prison, but look at that scroll of ceiling setting up locking down three. Figgy giving him some pepper for now as Goku leaps back, giving out the armor. Huge condemn from Fury, but as it was the follow-up after that leap out from the URL, not too problematic. Root lands there, forcing the iron skin out from Fury. Bud's being pressured by droplets. He's going to be moving up. Jet Propulsion comes in, but LFM's health bars are falling, whittling away here, j -Hal. They need to make something happen if they're going to contest this point. It seems like they're comfortable with backing out for now, forfeiting a bit of percentage, and then get the reinitiation. Buds and Draded most likely have tap, and their mana bars are the only thing that were decreased. That was only 50%. The build that we're seeing for white main at that level four does give you mana back. So there is that adjustment, and sustain is the name of the game. You have single target healing, you have first AoE heals, you have a lot going. We actually do see the Aloon's chosen pickup. So big deviation there, having the opportunity to isolate a specific target and then making Draded's auto attack damage translate over to healing there. See how that works here as Goku leaps forward. He's going to get punished for a moment. Bud's already having to drop the cleanse. A lot of that was due to miscommunication. Priz already had a turret and ended up forcing Draded to go back and grab that. Now overtime has been locked in and Prismat and team are just bullying them out of the way, walking them down and forcing back LFM. So Protector picked up. This is generally the window that you and I talk about, Dreadnought, that's probably the most forgiving to give up the Protector before it gets really close to that level nine mark and then we see that 10 snowball. Yeah, though that is maybe, you know, objective-wise relative to the map, maybe a better circumstance here, I feel like, compared to what we can see other Ball Sky Founder games. One thing that is very different is the success of these LFM esports on that objective itself. There was almost no case in time where you were like, is Octalysis second guessing their positioning on this objective? And that isn't that problematic, but it's mainly the double support, double, you know, the Zool and the double kind of melee assassins of the composition of Octalysis that I feel like is too much for LFM to handle right now. And I'm not sure that quickly turns once heroics get picked up. And so I feel like there is a responsibility to identify whatever that adjustment is going to be throughout this game very, very fast. Otherwise, it might get out of control. And maybe that's done here on top. 
And here's that window. It's just before level 10, and they're getting the pressure onto Goku. Nice oil goes down, but Goku able to walk away. And had that been a quarter level later, Dreadnought, that would have been too much of a threat for 10 and a forfeiture of that fort. So LFM, I think, held on as well as they could in that situation. They did. They ended up stopping the bleeding there for a moment. But Octalysis, they aren't going to let up. This is going to be them backing out, picking up the support camp with this downtime. We'll see if they finish off that top four or decide to use their resources elsewhere in this time frame with the 10 advantage. Still half a level. It looks like top will be the focus for them. Love the proactive play here coming out from Octalysis. Goku may be under too much pressure for a moment there. Changing up his heroic Yeah, going as to take well. ground. Yeah. Think about this. Ball lightning goes down, and if you have the synergy between the Skeletal Mages and a Star Ball, try walking away from that ball lightning bouncing around on your team. If they pull that off, that will be devastating in a fight, but LFM has done well to hold on. They give up the, the fort. They find themselves a level down despite the lack of a kill on the other side, but it's just due to the amount of control that we've seen from Octalysis in the early game, but they're still very much in this game. Yeah, the Death Ball Wombo combo of Octalysis is actually ridiculous when looking at their composition between the Starfall, uh, the Sacred Ground, and the, white, uh, the Scarlet Aegis opportunities, and Lightning Ball from the Cassia. I mean, when they use their heroics, they are an AoE dead ball composition that almost always find themselves a killer. Jhao, even more on top of that, we don't get to see the, uh, the sacred ground too often there, but stacking that with the Scarlet Aegis, territorially speaking, Urel is afraid of absolutely nothing over that point for a yeah. very long period of time. If only it's stacked fully, but it maxes out at 75. Uh, so you're only still, missing five armor. It's still like, <laughs> and that's four seconds. She's just yeah. like, yeah, I'm not afraid of really just about anything whatsoever there. If I'm in that situation, I'm saying I'm not afraid to take a stand. Everybody come hold my hand. Something about that. Yeah. One, three, one here for Octalysis. We'll and win the, this fight together. Yeah, we will. We're remixing it. We're, we're, we're messing up a few words. That's okay. Goku under assault. Condemn will land. Take your ground, though. Should be able to survive, but Lornado's there. Healing Pulse forced to go down. Goku has one jump, but nice interrupt. Very well timed there by Fury as he saw those wings light up. When you see the wings light up, you know you only have a brief second for that charges for him to jump out. But the stun there by Fury committing a short cooldown on a heroic is enough to buy time, get them back in the game experience-wise, and make it a much better fight over the next control point. Heads up play there by LFM. Yeah, and even I feel like the follow-up to the immediate siege damage afterwards to make sure they catch up within the experience. Prismat now is going to be under pressure for a moment. Is the lightning ball actually going down? The blind's going to be there. A lot of damage onto oh Fury my. along with Prismat there. But look at that three-for-one trade. Octalysis dominating that skirmish there. So much damage out from Cassia in that last couple of seconds. I said, wow, what is this going to look like if Starfall and the mages come in the ball lightning? That's what it looked like. That didn't take very long to unfold. One thing that's also going to be fun is Martial Law at 16 for Cassia for even more damage to play around those slows and the different amounts of control to dish out even more damage in those fights. It's going to be fun to watch as this unfolds. Control point started in this top lane, but even talent tiers for LFM to try and re-engage. Only about 10 second difference from the major wombo combo of Octalysis between the Taronda and the Zul Skeletal Mages setup. And having the Phoenix Heroic available back for LFM. We see the Sacred Ground use early there from Goku, but that is not a long cooldown. About 35 seconds till that's going to be back online, and that will be before the end of this control point B if Octalysis does not end up winning it. You have to walk off that thing for it to disappear. Yeah. So he's just chilling here for a while. He's holding point. A lot of focus there. Bless Shield still available. That will knock you off point. Good Lornado. That will buy time. Another short cooldown, but the trade out, it was 35 seconds when you noted it. It's already down to 10 seconds approximately at this point to be used again. Goku proceeds to be the man who moves up. Octalysis is, though, now backing out, looking for alternative pressure. Where are they going is the question here. They're going for the turret camp, but are they looking at that just to have extra pressure, or are they going to look to try and catch somebody out? I can't help but feel like it's just for the extra pressure and the force of the 16 advantage yeah. due to that Zul wave clear in the off lane. This is a, I, I can't help but feel like it is a safer call in theory, but if they miss this window a little bit too much and then have a blip here over this next initiation, it's a major setback compared to the situation 
they could have found themselves. Justin's getting that one last wave mid. This one up at the top will help a lot. He'll make his rotation up. Nice play there, Buds, with the level 13 root from White Main. He says, no Justin, no Zul, no problem, as he makes the play from the support role, which is why we see White Main do so well in this situation. And LFM, again, without the Justin available there in that skirmish, that would have been one of the opportunities for them to really be able to thrive and gain momentum back over that control point. Not going to be the case, and Octalis is finding another way to punish here. We're going to see what they can make happen here with another thing that likes to punish. Between the Hunter's Mark from the trait from Taronda, now we have the amplified damage when you get rooted or hit with that Bone Prison. They don't stack. Max is out at negative 25, but that does give you the negative 25. So single target focus is very much there on multiple fronts. Several routes are now available for this team. So the control that they had before is now even greater for this team. And Martial Law with the pickup by Cassia means more damage coming out from her as well. Another cool little synergy there, though, considering a Loon's Chosen at 7, stacking that with the 16 single target damage output of Taronda. Yeah. Just makes it to where it's going to be not only more healing output capable, capable, but then it also incentivizes that single target kill potential while maximizing healing output within this composition for Octalysis. As they continue the siege, 16 still out of the window here for LFM as they're getting a full five-man collapse. Zul in mid still showing himself. This is the moment for LFM to bring the fight if they're ever going to get it. Zul is making his way back down as the Lornado is out there. Now Prisma and friends with being a full five man, they're ready to take this fight with the 16 talents here. Lightning ball out. Iron skin was used because of that root. So now they can turn and focus on that. They're doing just that. That's why they targeted Fury. There they go. There's the amplified damage that's coming in. But now we've got the salvo out in return. And there's so much healing output on the side of Octalis. His only Goku sits even relatively low, and he's got plenty of heals to go on. He's got the armor. They're going to get a kill. They're looking for a second. The droplet's able to warp out in time. Things spiraling out of control for LFM, but picking up tremendously for Octalis. And Goku's just over here playing leapfrog with LFM with how often he is just leaping and diving onto the back line. Octalis is now focusing onto the core. Nine seconds out from the sacred ground opportunity. Therefore, Goku, the man tanking the core here at this point in time, 40% Octalysis. 13 minutes and a half in, look like they are ready to take it. Game number one over LFM Esports. To just recap the last week plus, Octalysis 3-0 Tempo Storm in pretty dominant fashion, went all five games with Heroes Hearth, normalized their drafts towards the end of that series, but all of their victories, Dreadnought, they're not just hard fought, drag them out victories. They're making a lot of their victories look easy. So when they're rolling and they're doing things their way, it looks good. I think the best way to kind of talk about that is, uh, I, I don't remember who it was in the interview, but they painted it as Octalysis likes compositions that are good from a leading position. They are, uh, you hear me oftentimes talk about the composition that is the most forgiving more often than not the best because given the large enough sample size in a game, if I keep it at the same talent tier, I'm going to have the better, most amount of chances to make a big play and overcome that. Octalysis don't have that paradigm whenever they approach their drafting. Instead, it is very much the have the specific elements that put us on the even footing early on. And when we get that lead, we become very, very oppressive. So the question is, is what happens when it looks like, you know, it suffers in the early game? Does it have the ability to recover in the long run? And not enough teams, it seemed like at this point, are even at a position to be able to debate that because they just get the lead and it is all over before it's, it really even kind of begins. This composition scares me. The Zul seems like an interchangeable piece. You can put any hero there. Yeah. But the Taronda White Main healing output, and I think it's different because it's Volskaya. The sustain on the control point is the name of the game yeah. more often than not, and it looked really good in the, in the first one. That's when they got the lead. The combo and that choke point, that's kind of when it opened things up and put things in their favor. But it seems like that's a very strong combo. We've seen the Uther white main from them before with Justin on the Uther. The white main seems to be the main support of we're going to run double support. But now with Taronda, the potential to put out some damage, it was crazy because the average hero damage that we see put out from supports, from your general supports that we've had over the last few years, I've, I've noted this before, but it's somewhere between 10 to 13,000 hero damage, average hero damage from support players. 
Taronda, I looked at the stats from the EU game before we came on here. Deckard, right around 11, 12K for the losing team or one of the teams. Taronda on the other side, like 42K. That's what she brings to the table. And in a double support role, if you can put out 40K plus damage in a support role, yeah. even in a double support role, that's right up there with other assassins in some regards. So it's it's going to be very interesting to see how this unfolds. There's only one major element, because I feel like everything you're saying, completely correct, right? And in the past, we can look at what heroes were able to fill that void of having enough healing, but also enough damage, and what were some of the problems that exist. I think Tassadar is a perfect example of a character for a long period of time. Yeah. How, enough damage to be that role, but enough supporting to be like, well, you just pick this, and it's hard to even say it's a double support at that point, because the damage output's so high. But what Tassadar does in that Toronto does not, is way, way clear. clear. And that is the biggest difference is nobody has ever found a position to make sure that they get the advantage against Octalysis and Wave Clear because they're always using the offlane role to either be the Junkrat who's dominating through that while they have the Diva on the front line, the Zool on the offlane to be able to get that Wave Clear. Until somebody figures out how to win in the Wave Clear against Octalysis, they're going to keep snowballing these games. It's going to be hard if Zool's the main tank for yeah. Octalysis. He's got pretty good Wave Clear. That was Octalysis' battleground choice. That's where they wanted to go. They had a strategy for it. This